Today, Cuba is one of the last vestiges of Marxist-Leninism and was the only successful communist revolution in the Western Hemisphere. Under the polarizing Fidel Castro, the country was turned from an exotic playground for the capitalist bourgeoisie into a supposed dictatorship of the proletariat. This nation, politically speaking, is unique in the Caribbean, but nonetheless fascinating not only for its geopolitical role, but also for its biology. Modern Cuba features a vast assortment of reptiles, birds, and mammals, coming in at around 490 species. Though I cannot cover them all, there are some honourable mentions I'd like to discuss. The bee hummingbird is the tiniest bird on the planet, coming in at around 6.1 centimetres, or 2.5 inches, beating their wings at 80 times per second. It is a marvel of evolutionary engineering, and is unique to Cuba alone. Cuban crocodiles make up for their smaller size with their highly robust legs, meant for chasing down larger prey than themselves. These animals are the national reptile of Cuba, and are critically endangered, being restricted to one island and the Zapata Swamp, a rich wetland where many endemic species of Cuba have been discovered. And finally, a unique group of Caribbean mammals, called the Hutia, have a distinct Cuban species. You can find an apparently abundant population of these creatures on the friendly Guantanamo naval base, run by the USA. The Lost Ice Age saw many iconic beasts, from the declining woolly mammoth to the gargantuan giant sloth. The sheer amount of fascinating megafauna around in this period was not restricted to the mainland. One of the first things that was different about the Caribbean and Cuba during the Pleistocene was the ice caps led to far more land and many more islands being connected. Due to less water being circulated, an arid and humid climate could be found on Cuba. And though this was harsh, biodiversity flourished with the giant ground sloth, primates, flightless birds, and other natural oddities evolving on the unique island of Cuba. Biodiversity flourished, with giant ground sloth, primates, flightless birds, and natural oddities evolving on Cuba. One of the more important events that led to Cuba's huge burst in biodiversity is the potential for a land bridge between Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula, in what is now Belize, Guatemala, and Mexico during the Eocene, and perhaps even the Oligocene periods. Even if we don't have certainty of this new land bridge, the coastlines were different and definitely smaller, making it easier for mammals to swim across and populate Cuba. And so, with all of this preface out of the way, what are the Pleistocene megafauna of Cuba? And so, with all of this preface out of the way, what are the prehistoric megafauna of Cuba? It wouldn't be an island video without a flightless seabird, and this time, we have the very extreme Cuban crane, a slenderly built bird that is a complete far cry from the mainland sandhill crane. It had distinctly stockier legs, a larger size, and a pectoral girdle with adaptations that imply flightlessness. Antigonku bensis has little research, but is still a notable chapter in the vast assortment of flightless birds found in the world. When talking about island animals, we often see a lot of extremities from tiny elephants, giant swans, and crocodilian relics. Very rarely do we see a flightless bird of prey. Fortunately, Cuba has that void in your life covered, even if you didn't know you had it. The giant Cuban owl is the most insane animal I have ever covered on YouTube. It grew to a beastly 1.1 meters in length, and grew anywhere from 11 to 30 kilograms in weight. It had comically long legs, jutting out like no other owl I can think of, almost resembling that of an extra tall gonk droid. Much like with the flightless Cuban crane, we only really have implied terrestrial lifestyle for this bird, with the keel of their sternum being significantly reduced. Though it would definitely have been a strong runner, it is thought to still have the ability for short bursts of flight, meaning it was not completely terrestrial. Though this is still to be debated, and we need better fossils to truly discover the lifestyle of this animal. Cuteas, infant crocodiles, and other small mammals were not off the menu for these birds, acting as some sort of late Pleistocene terror bird. As of 2024, there are two species, Onomegalonyx oterioi 
and Onomegalonyx ewingi, the latter being 30% larger than the former. These are some of the craziest owls of all time, and this isn't even where the bizarre species of owls end. The Cuban flightless owl was not the only strugiform to receive a heavy dose of Isla gigantism. The proportions of fragmentary Rivero's barn owls seem to suggest an owl larger than any living species. Though there is not much to be said about this bird, it's still worth recognition, and perhaps filled a similar niche to the Cuban flightless owl, also hunting infant crocodiles, uteas, and many other small mammals. A whole genus of ground sloth evolved probably independently to a degree from the prominent Megatherium bloodline. These animals evolved to be far more like large rodents than the elephant-sized titans that dominated mainland South America. The most basal species is Acrotochnus, which was widespread across not just Cuba, but the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Puerto Rico, presumably when they were all connected. They were semi-arboreal, having reasonably hooked claws, much like their living relatives, and had a small size in comparison to later species. Though still huge in comparison to the modern sloth, they were lighter than that of the later Megalanchus rodens, which was 100 kilograms bigger at 250 kilograms. Later Megalonchus was a far more ground-feeding sloth, losing much of the arboreal traits in favour of becoming a grazer. Around 11,000 years ago, there was a sharp decline in diversity of these ground sloths, but the isolated nature of these animals ended up making them outlast their far larger relatives on the mainland, with the last recorded fossils of these animals being found in the Holocene, the period we are still currently in. Parochnus was smaller than a black bear, with morphological differences that gave it an advantage in survival in the Holocene. It had a greater range of motion and was 10 to 15% smaller than its ancestors. In comparison to its other relatives, it lived in a lowland habitat, which may have helped it survive, as it could have a far more generalist diet. There should also be an honourable mention to the surviving Neocnus in Haiti, which lasted to a similar, slow end. The last survivors of a once glorious dynasty of brown sloth, these animals were probably hunted to extinction by the first colonisers of Cuba around 5,000 years ago. A tragic end. Cuba in the Pleistocene was a unique last holdout and first holdout for gigantic owls, brown sloth, and so much more. A few honourable mentions for creatures that only lived in the Holocene, or did not have enough details for us to really talk about, include the Cuban rail, the Cuban condor, Oscarvis Olonzi, the Cuban vulture, and Paralauta. Thank you very much for watching. A huge thank you to my patrons Goji Berry, Toby, and Zendiatrix. See you up ahead.